This was the 2013 Ballon d'Or ceremony, during which a then 28-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo received the Ballon d'Or prize, beating out his career-long rival Lionel Messi and French winger Franck Ribéry. Ronaldo accepted the award with teary eyes, prefacing his speech by stating that he had no words to truly describe how he was feeling. This moment underscores the gigantic impact the Ballon d'Or has on its recipients and the football industry at large. But how did this award attain such prestige and the admiration of every footballer, past and present? What is the selection process for determining the winner of such a revered prize? And is bias at play in this process? All these questions will be answered in the politics of Ballon d'Or. Established in 1956 by sports writers Gabriel Hanot and Jacques Ferrand, the Ballon d'Or is the most prestigious individual award a male football player can receive. The prize is currently awarded to the football player deemed to have performed the best over the previous football season and has been presented every year with the exception of 2020 due to COVID restrictions. The award is bestowed by the French news magazine France Football and its eponymous ceremony in Paris. Although the award was established almost seven decades ago, the reputation it holds today as an international accolade is quite recent. Up until 1995, only European football players were eligible candidates for the award, and it was only in 2007 that the award became a global prize, with all professional football players around the world becoming eligible for nomination. Furthermore, it was only in 2018 that its female equivalent, the Ballon d'Or Féminin, was introduced to the actual ceremony. On top of the progressive transformations the prize and ceremony have undergone, the award has also experienced multiple supervisory changes. In 2010, FIFA and France Football Magazine agreed to merge the Ballon d'Or Award with FIFA's World Player of the Year prize to create the FIFA Ballon d'Or Award. This merger lasted from 2010 to 2015, and this is the period when the Ballon d'Or gained worldwide popularity and recognition as the most coveted individual award in the industry. The partnership eventually ended in 2016 and the award reverted back to the Ballon d'Or, with FIFA returning to its own separate annual award, the Best FIFA Men's Player. The Ballon d'Or award went back to being solely presented and organised by the France Football magazine, and it was reported in 2023 that France Football magazine had agreed to a deal with UEFA, the governing body for European football, that would see the association co-organise the award ceremony. The criteria for the sporting duration considered for the award has also undergone modification. Previously, a player's individual performance and achievements in the preceding calendar year were analysed when considering the Ballon d'Or, but France Football revised this in 2022, and now only the previous football season from August to July is taken into consideration. Despite all the systemic and organisational shifts surrounding the award and its accompanying ceremony, the Ballon d'Or is still seen as the ultimate recognition that an individual football player can receive, both from fans and players alike. From a footballer's perspective, winning the Ballon d'Or serves as both a means to solidify their legacy as a top player and a way to enhance their monetary prospects as a celebrity. According to reports, it includes agreements with Adidas, who is the main sponsor of the MLS, where Messi would snag a cut of any increase in Adidas profits resulting from his involvement in MLS. Footballers and athletes in general do not solely operate as sportsmen. Due to their exceptional athletic qualities, they also attract public attention and transcend their original athletic purpose to become celebrities. Achieving celebrity status as an athlete is powerful, given the positive accomplishments they have that can be easily commodified through sponsorships, endorsement deals, and to some extent, even professional contracts. That's why the issue of image rights, the rights an individual holds in their own persona, such as name, photo, likeness, and personal brand, has become increasingly important to the latest generation of players. The matter is so significant that in 2023, French football player Kylian Mbappé refused to take part in a photo shoot with the French national team due to a disagreement over image rights standards with the French Football Federation. Alongside image rights, there is also the power of media hype. In football circles, the English media is particularly seen as a bastion of media hype, elevating the professional profiles of players and exaggerating their potential. Although media hype can help boost a player's professional profile, marketability and celebrity 
It also puts more expectations and pressure on them to live up to their prophesized persona and perform at a level that they may not be able to achieve yet. This can ultimately lead to the ruination of a player if they can't handle the pressure. But media play and image rights are just two ways to affirm celebrity as a footballer. Traditionally, the surefire way of ensuring continuous confirmation of celebrity has been through on-field success, such as winning the World Cup or other championships. But because trophies are shared with teammates and coaches, individual awards like the Ballon d'Or, a prize that singles out the best player in the world, help to validate and build a player's legacy and remarkability as an athlete. This validation can be commodified to secure high-paying and high-end endorsement deals, as well as leveraged for high-paying professional contracts. So winning the Ballon d'Or, or even being in the running, can strengthen the state of a player's career and celebrity in the present, while also safeguarding their future legacy as a top player. The voting process for the Ballon d'Or has undergone multiple iterations. Between 1956 and 2006, the electorate was composed of a jury of football journalists accredited to the National Soccer Federations within UEFA. After 2007, the pool of eligible voters was expanded to include a jury of specialist journalists as well as the coaches and captains of national teams. Despite the various mechanisms for candidate nomination and voting over the years, the editorial board of France Football has consistently served as a nomination board for the final list of candidates, which typically ranges from 23 to 30. Voters were required to cast ballots for five candidates on the list, expressing their preferences through a ranking system by assigning five points to their top-ranked candidate, four points to their second-ranked candidate, and so forth. The candidate with the highest total points is then elected as the winner. Since 2010, however, electors have had the option to cast only three ballots, ranking their top three candidates, who then receive five, three, and one votes, respectively. The politics of the Ballon d'Or come into play when defining what the best is. Before the rule changes in 2022, voters were instructed to consider a player's individual and team performances during the previous 12 months, including championships won, skills, and fair play on the field. Interestingly enough, voters were also instructed to consider the off-field behavior of a player, as well as his personality and charisma, or what the French call rayonnement. Post-2022, these qualifications remain the same, with the exception of only the seasonal year being considered and not the calendar year. On the surface, the criteria seem fairly open and inclusive, but when you examine the pattern of winners during the last two decades, certain trends begin to emerge. Despite the existence of 40 professional football leagues, the largest leagues in Europe, namely the top divisions in England, France, Germany, Italy and Spain, are significantly more likely to have representation among the top vote-getters. In fact, since 1995, Ballon d'Or winners and the top three finishers are more prone to be playing in the top five leagues than any other league. In the earlier decades of the award, there was a broader array of leagues represented. But as the award progressed towards the modern day, winners and the top finishers have become more concentrated in the four biggest leagues, with Spain's La Liga supplying more winners and top finishers than all the other major leagues combined. Although the big Spanish clubs, Barcelona and Real Madrid, have produced most of the winners since 1995, a figure undoubtedly bolstered by the reign of Ronaldo and Messi, these clubs have always been among the most likely to have the best players. This trend dates back to the 1950s, with great players like Alfredo Di Stefano and Ferenc Puskas representing Real Madrid, for instance. Over time, smaller clubs in less prominent leagues have started to lose out. This trend is particularly notable when you look at top finishers prior to 1995. While big clubs like AC Milan and Bayern Munich have consistently produced Ballon d'Or contenders, historically a significant number also hailed from smaller clubs in lesser-known leagues. So not only is playing for one of the biggest clubs in Spain a better guarantee for having a chance at winning the Ballon d'Or than anything else, but this tendency also has become more pronounced over time. Alongside clubs, there are also trends regarding the nationality and playing positions of top finishers for the Ballon d'Or. When it comes to nationality, the major soccer nations of the world consistently produce disproportionately high numbers of Ballon d'Or winners and vote-getters, a trend that has persisted for a very long time. However, ever since non-Europeans became eligible for the award in 1995, Argentines and Brazilians have become more likely to provide contenders. But perhaps the most controversial aspect of the Ballon d'Or is that its recipients are overwhelmingly strikers. Football is a game where the team operates in harmony through tactical formation to achieve results. Goalkeepers and defenders are tasked with preventing opposition from scoring. Strikers are attacking players focused on scoring goals, and midfielders play a dual role involving both defense and attack. 
There is an argument to be made that all these positions are equally important, as a team can't rise to the top without competent players fulfilling each role. But what's interesting when you look at the positions of Ballon d'Or winners and vote-getters is that the likelihood of performing well in the Ballon d'Or increases as a player's positions move them further up the field. Both before and since 1995, significantly more strikers have excelled in the Ballon d'Or than players in any other position. And similar to the concentration of players in particular leagues, this pattern has become more pronounced over time. With only three defenders ever winning the award and only one single goalkeeper ever winning it, a large reason for the idolization of strikers by both the industry and fans is the narrative presented in the broadcasting of football. Broadcast filming and commentary in football focus on the entire field and the team at large through specific camera angles and composed narration. It's only when goals are scored that we receive more visual coverage of the players and ecstatic commentary. This creates a specific audiovisual narrative around the goal scorer, elevating both the scorer and their scoring moments. This elicits a profound reaction from viewers who elevate the scorer's importance in their minds and in turn consider them to have a more crucial role than defenders. Even with these unofficial prerequisites, which have more or less been accepted, more skeptical theories have surrounded the award. Accusations of bias from the electorates enveloped Ballon d'Or discourse in 2021, when Messi won the award over Robert Lewandowski, and they resurfaced again in 2023, when Messi was once again awarded the honor over Man City's Erling Haaland. In both years, cases were made for Lewandowski and Haaland being unjustly deprived of the Ballon d'Or. The anxiety regarding bias is not unfounded. Whether you're looking at it from the outside or within the football community, there have been several eyebrow-raising concerns when it comes to both the Ballon d'Or recipient and ceremony. Specifically in the dominance of both Messi and Ronaldo, but particularly Messi in recent years. And for the most part, the concerns are right, at least from a psychological perspective. I should preface that although we are talking about bias, it is a fact that both Messi and Ronaldo are the best football players of our time, and possibly in history. And in both 2021 and 2023, Messi achieved incredible feats, especially in 2023, when his historic World Cup win played a significant role in his Ballon d'Or victory. Even so, how do voters conclude that Messi's achievements trump those of Haaland or Lewandowski when they are so closely tied? In the journal Messi, Ronaldo and the Politics of Celebrity Elections, published online by the Cambridge University Press, scholars theorize that football fans, and by extension, Ballon d'Or voters, engage in partisanship aka bias, similar to that of an American voter who holds a strong affinity for a political group or ideology. The paper relates the emotional connection a football supporter can have to their club with politics and how people often have a strong connection to a specific political party. On the political side, this concept can be seen as a form of party identification, a person's emotional connection to an important group in their environment. The idea suggests that your political loyalty or party identification is woven into your social identity. In other words, it's not just about liking a party's policies or leaders at a particular moment, it's more like a long-lasting part of who you are. Similar to how being a fan of a football team becomes ingrained in your self-image, the theory carries significant weight when you consider the circumstances surrounding most people's relationship with their club. Not only are most people long-time supporters of their team from childhood, but often, the club they support is tied to their family. Perhaps their father, uncle, or older brother supports the club and introduced them to it at a young age. In addition to supporting their football club, the theory also suggests that fans actively oppose the victories of rival clubs. So, if we were to apply this to the Ballon d'Or selection, electorates would have vested interest in casting their votes for players who represent their club, even if there is another player who may be the better option. I personally theorize that, in addition to voters becoming attached to clubs and consequently voting for players nominated from that club, the almost mythological status achieved by legendary players like Messi and Ronaldo has managed to create parasocial attachments, not just with clubs, but also individual players. In football circles, there's an inside Matrix-esque joke that all matches and ceremonies are predetermined, and the football players are simply following the script. Although this is obviously just a joke and we don't actually live in a hyper-reality, there is something to be said about voters potentially being influenced by the media representations of footballers and the narrative that surrounds them. Messi being presented with the Ballon d'Or by David Beckham, who just so happened to become his boss a few months prior for the year he won the World Cup, is part of the script. 
He earned it fair and square through voting, but there's also a good chance the voters saw this moment and wanted to realize it. In that way, it's similar to how the Oscars and the Grammys work. Much of the voting isn't just about the winner, but also the story and narrative surrounding them, making it political in this sense. This video was not made to discredit the accomplishments of Messi or any other footballer, but to provide insight into the subjectivity involved in selecting the awards recipient. It's important to note that the Ballon d'Or, while still an amazing spectacle, is not a holy grail. Voters are influenced by their own personal experiences, perceptions and partialities. The true value of a footballer cannot be quantified by one award or ceremony. Instead, the true value of a footballer lies in the connection they form with their fans and the culture.